Yeah, you know, in the uh, ancient Sanskrit traditions of Hinduism, cannabis is described as the queen who conquered all worlds and is also revered in that tradition as um, a master of plant medicine. And um, so I agree with that. I think in some ways I identify cannabis as a psychedelic like ayahuasca and uh, psilocybin, mescaline. Um, but there does appear to be qualities that transcend even the definition of psychedelics. And I'd, I'd love to talk about that. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Psychedelic Conversations podcast. So happy to have you guys here. And let's welcome our guest, Daniel McQueen. Welcome. So great to have you joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Susan. I'm happy to be here. Brilliant. So just going to give you a little bit of your background to our listeners so they know and they can sort of connect with you and what you do. So you are an MA in psychedelic, as a psychedelic specialist, educator, author of the book, Psychedelic Cannabis, Therapeutic Methods and Unique Blends to Treat Trauma and Transform Consciousness. You founded, um, you have in 2012, you co-founded one of the first legal psychedelic plant medicine therapy clinics in the United States, Boulder, Colorado. And you are currently celebrating 10-year anniversary. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks so much. And the same year, you have also founded Psychedelic Cities School, which I'm really, really interested. And hopefully we can dive into that one. And you still continue to train students from around the world in mindfulness-based psychedelic therapy and cannabis-assisted psychedelic therapy. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, traditionally, we always ask our guest, what brings you to this work? So would like to hear a little bit about your story, if that's OK. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Not always the easiest question to answer. Right. It's because it's, it's so deep and personal. Um, what brought me to this work? I was just always curious as a child and always a little different. So I was open to exploring um, things outside the box, so to speak. And I also, you know, had my fair share of um, difficult experiences growing up, um, uh, growing up where I did in Little Rock, Arkansas. And um, I was always curious about psychedelics and medicine work and altered states of consciousness and uh, whether it was with medicines or not, you know, meditation. And even as a child, I was interested in mysticism and astral projection and things like that. Um, so I was always just really curious about what was on the other side or underneath things. And to me, psychedelics are the, are the best tool to explore those options. And so, you know, I, I, I stepped into psychedelics as a young adult, you know, as just in recreational settings, which I think like most people do. And, but I had the opportunity and was um, really honored and appreciate my experiences with intentional psychedelic communities, um, more from a spiritual perspective, a spiritual orientation of exploration and growth. And, uh, but I also saw that there were some major holes in um, that paradigm of just spiritual exploration. And so I got my master's in transpersonal counseling psychology with the intention of bringing in, you know, balanced psychological approach with my you know, the spiritual perspectives I had been taught. And um, one thing led to another. I thought I was going to maybe be an underground guide, you know, uh, but that was a long time ago. And a lot has changed since then. And uh, cannabis became legal here uh, in Colorado for adult use in 2014. And that's when I started to work with cannabis as a psychedelic. And I love to share more about that. It's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a big part of my process now. I've pretty much devoted my, you know, professional life to um, being an advocate for cannabis as a psychedelic. 
Um, so mm. brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing. You know, yeah. I um I have this uh shaman facilitator from Peru, Shibibo tribe, and um she always says that marijuana or cannabis. I don't know which which one to say because I'm not, as you can see, I'm not really much educated on on this sure. plant medicine. Yeah. But um, I know it as a marijuana. So mm. and um, and she would always say um, in their tradition, it is respected as the master sacred plant teacher, mm-hmm. uh, along with tobacco. So okay, which mm-hmm. both of these master sacred plant teachers in the West used recreationally all the time. I mean, in right. the mainstream known as a tobacco as, you know, cigarettes and smoking, but she always right. says, um, she always says, if I ask, if you wish to put them in category, she would say ayahuasca, mescaline, mushrooms, they could all come in one basket, but she says tobacco and marijuana would be the, the master plants of all. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, in the uh, ancient Sanskrit traditions of Hinduism, cannabis is described as the queen who conquered all worlds and is also revered in that tradition as um, a master plant medicine. And um, so I agree with that. I think in some ways I identify cannabis as a psychedelic like ayahuasca and uh, psilocybin, mescaline. Um, but there does appear to be qualities that transcend even the definition of psychedelics. And I'd, I'd love to talk about that at some point. I also honor tobacco as a, as a sacred plant medicine, but it's, you know, because of the recreational use and my family history and such, it's something that I choose not to use even ceremonially because of the addictive quality. Um, but I, I do have a lot of respect for that medicine. So my, in my desire to respect it, I choose not to use it. Um, so we don't mix cannabis and tobacco. Like it's real common in Europe to uh, mix those two medicines together. Um, but uh, but we use uh, real clean, natural uh, cannabis in, in these journeys. Um, and marijuana is a fine name to say. I think in the United States, it's kind of tangled up with a history of discrimination and prohibition and things. So, so I found, uh, and instead of uh, taking a name from a different religious tradition or spiritual tradition, just calling it cannabis seems to be the best um, path for me, at least. Um, mm. But yeah, both of those medicines are, are um, uh, I'd say tobacco for me is a gratitude medicine. It's smoked um, as a prayer of gratitude. And for cannabis, I would say it's a, it's smoked as a prayer for healing and awakening and to, de- and to deepen um, transcendent states. Um, so it can be very psychoactive. Mm, yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, with the tobacco, I know it from the hape uh, mm-hmm. medicine or rape medicine uh, mm-hmm. in traditional use. I, I mean, they use it too, as you probably know already, clearing the space and energies and all of that. I mm-hmm. think it's it's from, yeah, uh, you know, like um, uh, it, it's a powder, you know, snuff. So I just know it as that as the master teacher plant. So. Um, never smoked in my life, so I wouldn't have a clue how how people can have so much negative connotation with tobacco. For me, plants are plants, plant all of mm. them are teachers, whether psychedelic or not. I always revered them or see them as healers, teachers, guides, sure. allies. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, you know, tobacco is a like a <clears throat> it's been corrupted in some ways, you know, because of big money and, and these big companies, and it's not a very clean medicine and tobacco in, in cigarette form, but there are, there are ways to get it from a traditional space and um, organic ways. And I, I would recommend doing that if people choose to smoke. Um, again, it's, it's highly addictive though, unlike tobacco or unlike cannabis. So I, I would call, I would encourage everybody to be real mindful with that medicine. If, if you have, if, if you can use it only in ceremony, then that's great. But as a regular medicine, it's probably not the best for us, um, physically speaking. And, you know, the snuffs mm-hmm. are great too. I've done that once, but it's, you know, again, it's not really my medicine, but it's a real common practice. And, um, and there's a lot of really wonderful snuffs out there with tobacco, um, so if that's part of a, a spiritual tradition um, that you connect with in the community, I would I definitely recommend checking that out. 
Yeah, I heard you say it's not my medicine. I love this expression because a lot of the people that I speak with in this space of plant medicines, they always talk about the calling. It's not my calling. It's not my medicine. Mm -hmm. How would you, I mean? What, what's your take on on that? Is it is it mm -hmm. like we do we are we guided to a specific mm -hmm. sort of medicine? That's a good question, right? And if we're being guided, then what is guiding us? This is another question. Is it medicine itself? Um, yeah, uh, for sure. I think some people have a preference, right? Some people are drawn to a particular mind state that might be elicited more by LSD or psilocybin. Some people are more drawn to the plant medicines and others are drawn to the um, synthetic medicines. You know, there's, there's a debate on which is better, but I don't think there, you know, I don't know if that really matters. Um, but I would say my medicine is cannabis sativa. Um, and as far as being drawn to it and called to it, I think everything in my life and my training and education and experience all came together in the same moment it was legalized here in Colorado. And in the first ceremonies we did with it, they were just so beautiful and meaningful that it just became obvious, even at the beginning. And, and, it's, and since then, it's just become more obvious. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying. And, and it's hard not to put a um, spiritual meaning to the depth and synchronicity that occurred in that, you know, and so I, you know, I believe that there's something bigger than us um, and um, it can help support us and that maybe we're called to be advocates for these medicines and some are advocates for psilocybin and others are, to, are called to be advocates for others. You know. Thank you so much for sharing. So uh, would you mind telling us about the strains and and also you talked about your favorite sativa is it sativa you said um if if anyone's never heard of it before say they are listening for the first time how would you describe the differences and the different the strains, strains and stuff right yeah types. yeah mm -hmm. I think that's really important. So particularly in areas where it's not yet legal, um, you might have access to very few strains, um, which are different um, families of the medicine, you know, grown by different people, different uh, qualities and, and techniques, and it just changes the effects of the medicine. So if you're, you know, in the UK or wherever, you know, you might just have access to medicine that gets you high or, or stoned, you know, stereotypically. But where I live in Colorado, um, we have access to really high quality organic medicine that has a strong uh, THC content. Um, and so it's very clean and, um, and it can smell like lavender, it can smell like roses, it can smell like lemons or pine needles. Uh, it can smell like rich earth or, or you know, even the stere stereotypical skunky medicines. Um, and, uh, and these different smells point to what we would call fam like strain families. And the three primary strain families are sativas, indicas, and kind of a middle ground called hybrids, hybrids of sativas and indicas. And the sativas are uh, very uplifting. They're more like a cup of coffee. Uh, they're very creative and mind expanding, um, and they can be psychedelic, uh, but they're also can be anxiety producing, you know, just get a little too like, like if you had too much coffee or something. Uh, the indicas, on the other hand, are like lavender. They're relaxing. They help us sleep, um, enjoy an evening off of work, things like that. Um, um, and they help relax tension in our bodies. And so they're good for pain management and like symptom management and things like that. But they can also make us a little droopy or dull in the in, in our minds. Um, some people prefer indica, some people prefer sativas. Uh, they have different uses. And hybrids as a middle ground are, are very heart opening, um, emotionally heart opening. Um, and, and so what, what I do with my practice in making cannabis a psychedelic medicine is that it's not just one particular strain. It's a blend of multiple strains. And so a basic blend would be a third indica, a third sativa, and a third hybrid. And so you get a very open heart experience. Uh, your awareness of body, you know, and, and tension in the body is reduced and, you know, your somatic awareness is increased. And the, um, and you have it, you're in a deeply advanced, um, altered state of consciousness that's very creative and enlightening and energetic. 
Um, so all of them combine and you get all the good qualities and all the negative traits kind of ca cancel out. So the dullness or the anxiety will cancel out. And, um, and so it just creates this full body, open hearted, mind awake experience. And if you add a particular set and setting to it, then it can become very psychedelic. Um, uh, I've just really grown to love the experience very much. And I, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to share it with uh, you know, so many people too, you know. That's beautiful. And you said about um, cannabis assisted uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you all also say that it's a psychedelic experience, which is quite rare to hear because a lot of people probably won't class this medicine right. as psychedelic. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Listeners who are probably heard the Maybe only a the, suspicious the, yeah, of... <laughs> recreationally, I'm, I, would, I would always yeah. ask our guests, like, what is your biggest challenge when it comes mm. to educating people mm. who are so immersed in the recreational side of the life? And then mm. suddenly now you come up and say, hey, look, we've got this modality and we have this blend and with this kind of prep and process and integration, this could be a psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. Do you, yeah, we, uh, we joke uh, that psychedelic therapy is already legal because mm -hmm. and plant medicine therapy is already legal. We just forgot mm -hmm. we could use cannabis as a psychedelic. Um, yeah. So it's, you know, scientifically, it is classified as an hallucinogen. Um, you know, so there's, you know, some scientific backing into that. It, it also uh, impacts the same neuro receptors, uh, the 5-HT2A receptor, as psilocybin does and ayahuasca, you know, so, but the research is still very preliminary, you know. Um, so one, I would just say, again, the issue of quality is a factor, right? Like if you have lower grade medicine, if you smoke a whole bunch of it, it's really not going to get you into these psychedelic states. But if you get the right medicine, um, it's, it is dose dependent. So if like, like, so you think of like a recreational user is just smoking less. Um, uh, so it'd be similar to microdosing with psilocybin, right? Like you won't have a psychedelic experience if you're microdosing psilocybin, but if you take the same medicine, at, you know, 10 times the dose or whatever, it's going to be a substantially different experience, you know? So <clears throat> So the subjective experience in the right set and setting with the right container and, and very simple mindfulness practices, is, it's not that much, you know, it is, it is the medicine doing most of the work. It's uh, more often described as just like ayahuasca um, for the, for my clients and the people who have taken ayahuasca before they'll say, they'll sit up after the journey and say, that was just like my ayahuasca journey. Other people will describe it as uh, similar to psilocybin, you know, and again, just as intense as these medicines. Um, and then it's not uncommon for people to have full DMT level experiences. And I've had experiences that are indistinguishable from all of these other medicines, including LSD and mescaline. It, it, it's, and it's interesting. It'll show up as different medicines, even in the same session. Um, so it's like a transpersonally or spiritually, it has kind of a shape shifting quality to it. Um, the one difference, though, between us, cannabis and other psychedelics is that we have a we generally retain our sense of agency and we feel very supported in the experience. Um, so as with uh, like psilocybin, it may be a di really difficult experience that you're thrust into um, with cannabis. You more like ease into the experience and you get to choose to have a difficult experience and you still feel supported. So. In a way, cannabis is also like a what I would call a plant-based empathogen. So it has similar qualities as MDMA. Um, and so in the session work, it can be used as MDMA for the treatment of trauma. People go through a lot of life review experiences. And if they've had difficult experiences that have caused trauma, they'll, you know, that will show up for them to work with. Um, but they'll have a general felt sense of being okay. In, in, in that space, um, similar to MDMA. And then the, the one other area that is, seems to be unique about cannabis is that it is, um, it's, um, we call it an indelic or in, endodelic, meaning um, it amplifies our, our somatic or our body felt sense. And so it's like our whole body is tripping um, instead of just our minds or our hearts. Um, 
And so it releases tension in the body and it reduces inflammation because it's directly impacting the endocannabinoid system. And so that's how it can also be a good trauma resolution therapy is that it's actually releasing tension in our, in our tissue and our physical bodies. Um, so like I said, it's, it's like, it is a psychedelic, but I'm starting to believe it's like even more than a psychedelic, you know? I love that. And um, also we do know there are so many chemical compounds. I don't know how many hundreds, like, because you say it's somatic experience, somatically yeah. experienced in the body because of the high levels of different, different chemical compounds, I guess. That's right. Mm -hmm. And um, do you know what? I love what you said as well, um, that you, you know, if it's used properly from a therapeutic approach, it's almost indistinguishable uh, with other psychedelic substances. So do you know how I see it? I see um, all of them. You know, there are there are some uh, people that are really um, convicted in how they think. Oh, psilocybin will give you this effect, and ayahuasca is this, and then the mescaline is like this, and then mm -hmm. very sort of um, radically categorized. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, I always see the person as the container, mm -hmm. and the substances as a doorway. Mm -hmm. That you, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost like they're just different doors, but you enter into the same space. Mm -hmm. That's how I see them. Yeah. What are your thoughts on yeah. that? I would agree with that. Like my experience is, you know, the medicine just gives us access to a capacity that is um, authentically us, right? It's just amplified, right? So the word psychedelic, I like the, the definition of soul manifesting as opposed to mind manifesting but because it's just such a deep rich experience and it just shows the complexity of the human spirit and and the the bigness of who we are so i i agree with you 100 percent that these are more like keys or or openings and that maybe different medicines have different flavors you know like the visual experience might be slightly different or um, because of, you know, different neurological mechanisms occurring in the mind, but it's our mind having the experience. It's, it's you know, in a, in a way, it's just a molecule, right? It's, it's a substance. Um, so where does that content come from? It doesn't come from the molecule. It comes from our psyche. It comes from the depth of who we are as a human being. And, and so I think there's many paths into that space. And I, I also think there's like right, good uses for the different medicines. You know, I don't think cannabis is the end all. You know, I think I think it's uh, like we should have reverence and honor all of these um, medicines. Um, they all have an important place. Yeah, absolutely. And in while I was trying, I was gathering some information about you. I heard you saying on one of your interviews that um you know, uh, you said um, intervention is okay. You know, there are currently right now, we have so many mindfulness teachers, so many body workers, so many coaches that do breath work and yoga and all kinds of um, non-substance use. And, and we have a growing community of people who say, oh no, you don't need nothing. Everything mm -hmm. is within you. Everything is there. Mm -hmm. For you to access it's already within you just look in and and tap into it but obviously mm. i sense you come from a um trauma uh background psychology so you understand how difficult it can be for some of yeah. us to just tap into it and yeah. um and i like your idea of sometimes intervention is okay and and these are the substances we can use for intervention right yeah, maybe it's okay to ask for help or to receive mm. support, that, you know, not just rely on ourselves. Um, I think healing happens in community and healing happens together, not just as some internal experience. But, you know, this, this idea, one, I think some of the people who say that, like, it's all inside of us, you know, you just have to meditate or whatever. A lot of them started um, and had awakening experiences through psychedelic medicines, and so maybe they wouldn't even be on that path had, had it not been for the psychedelic medicine. So I think there's something there to that. The other piece is, you know, like we're really struggling as human beings and as a global culture. Um, and so we're not like starting from a neutral baseline. Some of us are really deeply struggling and, uh, yeah. and need support. And so, you know, people fly in from all over the country uh, to receive that support that, you know, they wouldn't, you know, they wouldn't be able to 
um, find that resolution elsewhere. And, and so we hold that um, as a really important part of the healing process. And, or somebody, somebody will come and say, I have a meditation practice, or I have a psychotherapy. I have a psychotherapist. I go weekly, but it's stalling out. I'm no longer making progress. I'm really stuck. Um, and so what these medicines can do is just like open that door, you know, like unlock that stuck door um, that just wouldn't be unstuck otherwise. And then they're able to move on um, and reinitiate their psychotherapy with greater movement or the mindfulness practice deepens and such. So I, I think of them as um, something that's supportive and could be an ongoing tool, it's like a communion, you know, in a way like you wouldn't like if you were Christian in the church, you don't take communion just once. It's something you return to again and again, because it provides some depth and meaning to uh, hum human experience, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you for sharing that. I do believe we have a symbiotic relationship with the nature and the plants. I do believe there are some some kind of allies that have been put yeah, on, right. on the planet. So, you know, we don't need to be rejecting them and also acknowledge is not for everybody also sure. but at, but at the same time um as you said on i think it was tim ferris he mentioned once that he said every influencer every successful leader you've ever known had or at least one time experienced like that which was really big yeah, well, uh, it's, a, mm -hmm. mm, it's a, a big announcement a big uh sort of you know argument but um mm -hmm. we don't know but um i do want to come back to what you said a lot Check of them yeah yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah no doubt yeah yeah and then rick doblin always says you know uh he wants to see uh people coming out of their psychedelic closet mm -hmm. um i mean sure. i understand because of the legal landscape a lot of people don't like to talk about it and now I mean, even having these kind of conversations is very, very powerful and new. And, um, you know, it's a breakthrough mm -hmm. if we think about it, even 10 years ago, 15, 20. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I really value that. But I um, just want to come back to um, intervention. And, mm -hmm. and you are trauma trained, I believe. And um, you understand how it works and you understand the nervous system and how we somatically experience all, the, all this trauma. So now we are suddenly, because of the pandemic, post-pandemic culture or post-pandemic reality has increased or, or, or the trauma that is suppressed in people are really arising at such a high rate. And um, do, you, do you think, like, you know, some people say psychedelics have their own agenda. Do you think we are having these conversations and we are at the peak or the renaissance, some people call it, of psychedelics, and they're coming on to the into the mainstream very fast. What are your observations mm -hmm. that is happening currently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it brings up, you know, speaking of interventions and what you're saying about what other people are saying about this time, um, Dennis McKenna, um, uh, who I've met and spoken to about this, he, he describes psychedelics as an immune system response of Gaia, you know, like the earth is like an immune system response to help humans wake up before we blow ourselves out of the water and take the rest of the planet with us. So it's like a, like a reactive natural immune system response of like this larger network of consciousness and, um, you know, uh, beings, right? Plants, meta, you know, animals and, and humanity. And I'm starting to wonder about that. I start, you know, like I can see this, the logic of that as well. And, and also, you know, humanity really needs <clears throat> not just intervention on a individual scale, but on a collective scale. And I think a part of my role of uh, being an advocate for cannabis is, is part of that larger movement because cannabis it's so safe as a psychedelic that it can be used in and scaled to small groups for therapeutic healing, but also larger groups for therapeutic healing. We've had groups as big as 50 people um, uh, in these circles, and it's very safe and contained, and people are having awakening, life-changing, and, and and deeply healing experiences. Um, so, so I think there is something underlying going on. And um, I would also be mindful that that, and that trend has to be balanced out with and our 
uh, protected from like um, maybe more of a financial influence in, in the culture, you know, and that and that these are the paradigms, maybe even the financial institutions that are working to bring them into the mainstream. In some ways, those might be the old paradigm, you know, attempting to control it or make money off of it. But I think psychedelics are just much more powerful than even those influences. So so I trust the medicine. Mm-hmm. And I trust the agenda of the medicine, even if I don't fully understand it. And, um, and, and we work in that space to keep people as safe as possible as, as they wake up. You know, um, I think that's mm-hmm. part of our, um, our requirement of being medicine people is to help people stay safe when they're waking up. Yeah. What does that mean to wake up, to heal? To, Gosh, that's to, a to, great question. To, right? bring, so, to yeah. bring resolution, that would be my simplified way. Yeah, of right. You know, like, yeah, awakening. What is that? What is enlightenment? You know, uh, I don't like the more I ask these questions, the less I understand them. Uh, you know, like so healing and awakening, healing. And uh, like to me, it's the same path. Like to heal means to wake up to oneself and our true potential. So I like to use the word awakening, uh, waking up um, to who we truly are. So it's also about self-actualization and personal empowerment, you know, like to wake up to the fact that we are capable human beings on the planet that has agency in our lives and can do something about uh, the world around us. So, you know, hopelessness is a uh, construct that's not maybe true. Um, And so waking up to who we truly are and how powerful we are as humans on the planet, that it's a collective experience. We need each other to help mirror each other so that we can wake up. But healing, you know, I think healing is part of that same path, that same line that uh, we're removing obstacles to our human potential. Um, And not I'm not going to become some enlightened guru. I'm just going to become more of who I already am, you know, Daniel McQueen with all my fallacies and glitches and also all my gifts. And and it's all part of just me and my perfection, you know, so. uh, So that's what I I think of when I think of waking up, just becoming who we already are. Yeah, that's great. It's it's almost like, you know, I have a I have a term for that. It's yeah. Um, yeah, it's just becoming better navigators in the three dimensional physical reality yeah. that we're perceiving. Yeah. So, yeah, this whole idea of enlightenment is actually that, right? It's simply becoming a better navigator in this physical mm. reality. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our, you know, so we call it cannabis assisted psychedelic therapy or CAPT, you know, and cap. So, like this kind of motif of being the captain of our own life, being the captain of our own ship, you know, like navigate the med- cannabis particularly but these medicines have all taught me how to better navigate the world not just leave it and go into some transcendent state but integration is making it impactful in a positive way in our lives and i think the navigation analogy is is like i'm i'm 100 percent identified with that as well you know, mm, yeah for sure That's great. And also want to come back to the group processes. So I'm a huge, huge advocate for group processes. And that's because I've probably had my biggest and most profound breakthroughs while being in a group containers. Mm -hmm. So um, somehow the solo journeys or the solo or, or the individual experiences or individual work is very limited in my eyes it's 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 only because we are inherently self-deceiving i would say yeah. hopefully hopefully this won't trigger anyone but we are we have blind spots right sure and that's why i love the group processes even even if it's just a small group even if if the people in there are really triggering and even if they are annoying, even if they are all different, come from different backgrounds and traditions and cultures and beliefs, I just love having these group containers where people are confronted left, right, center. And that is, for me, saves years of individual work in my eyes. And I love that you are doing a lot of group processes. Please talk to us a bit more about your experience with the groups. Mm-hmm. And why you are so interested in providing more of the group processes as yeah. well. Well, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, this construct of uh, psychotherapy session one on one, you know, it's not it's it's it has its place. I, I really believe that. And, and there are certain things that do require that one on one support that's very private and very intimate. 
But in my opinion, you know, our injuries happen in our families and in groups and in communities. So the healing occurs and in families and groups and communities as well. And some of us need to make our own families in a way, right? Um, and, and kind of reestablish that connection. Uh, we, I started out working with cannabis in groups. It was, it was how I started working with this medicine. So it's always been a big part of the process. And, and from there, I started to see how it could be used therapeutically in one-on-one -on -one sessions. So in, in a way, it, it started with groups. And w one, I think, um, well, well, you know, like in traditionally too, right? In the indigenous communities and other, other communities that bring medicines is, is that it's always done in groups as well. And unless there's like a real specific healing that occurs similar to going to the doctor or something. Um, uh, but also there's a social justice issue that's embedded in working with psychedelic medicines and that it has to be as accessible as possible. And, and, you know, this is an easy work and it's not inexpensive to, to hold space for others in a, in a, you know, in a, in an office clinical setting that we have here. And so one way to make it as accessible as possible is through group work. And, um, you know, like two, two, two guides with a small group of six to eight people, um, is way more affordable than two guides with one person, one, one client in a, you know, like similar to the MDMA work and stuff. So I think accessibility, again, we have to heal on a large scale and that's hard to do when you're doing one-on-one -on -one work, you know? Um, mm. So that's, yeah. that's my feeling of it. And, and then like you were saying, um, you know, we're all reflections of each other and we, you know, and we project our stuff and our, and we transfer our own, our former relationships, like say parental relationships or other family relationships onto the people around us. And so in some ways, the transference and projection that occurs in groups is an opportunity to like, okay, to acknowledge that it's a reflection or a reflection of self and old patterns. So it gives us an opportunity to wake up to those old patterns. And I think that that occurs in groups more often too. Um, when you have those dynamics. So I think it's all of the above. I love, I love working in groups. Mm, that's, that's beautiful. And, you know, I see trauma because people explain, there's a lot of definitions on trauma, emotional trauma that it's become very trendy, by the way. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. It's all, it's all because of Dr. Mate and his, his documentary, I think. No, mm -hmm. I'm joking, but it's probably because of the pandemic, you know, post pandemic, um, this push for people to, you know, it's almost like binary, you know, <clears throat> you either wake up <clears throat> or you, um, you know, you go back to your old ways. There's no going back now. So you either, you know, yeah. there is this, there is this really um, powerful force that are uh, pushing everyone forward, either to be congruent or it's almost like there's no other way, you know, right? or you're just stuck with all these, um, illnesses, pathological symptoms, mental, I mean, mental health right now is skyrocketed in the mm. last two years. And, you know, it's really, really um, worrying and concerning. And, and when I talk about the uh, trauma, I always say trauma is definitely for, the way that I understand it is a relational wound. Mm -hmm. That's probably why I love the group processes because in these groups we play out all of these relational wounds that we carry it's what a beautiful opportunity to reflect and become aware of those. Right. It's great. Right. Yeah. And hopefully, you know, and, and that, that the group is contained and supported by skilled facilitators mm -hmm. to help bring awareness to it and find resolution and to transform it into a healthier dynamic, you know, cause all of these, it's like turning lead into gold or something. All of these dynamics have a healthy aspect and it's just about orienting towards that health and well-being in community you know so mm -hmm. i i agree i think it's really important i think you know like any sort of crisis what i've what i've learned so we've had multiple regional you know ecological crises here in boulder uh, there was a major flood not you know you know uh, a few several years ago we just just at the beginning of this year our home like a thousand homes in our neighborhood burned down yeah you know and um and then there and then on top of that a global pandemic and and so we're in a period of crisis and i think the gift of crisis is that it jolts people awake they you know it pulls it pops them out of their malaise or dullness or unconsciousness and it gives them at least an opportunity to wake up 
And if you're struggling with a lot of things, you, you don't just wake up to the good things, you wake up to all of it. And so, yeah. and so that's why we need to like find ways to address uh, what we're waking up to naturally, you know, and mm. that's where the intervention comes in with these medicines for sure. Mm. Yeah. And thank you for doing the work in training facilitators to, to become space holders. Now that, you know, I think next two years will be probably super interesting in the healing space or healing arts or trauma healing or any, any sort of consciousness work. And sure. um, yeah. And, 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 you know, this is so great. Tell us a bit about your programs and how they are held. And, you know, if people sure. are interested, like, what would you tell us about it? Sure. So we have a center here uh, called the Center for Medicinal Mindfulness, and I work with psychotherapists and also uh, interfaith ministers to facilitate these psychedelic journey experiences. We have a medical doctor on staff, and um, and we uh, facilitate uh, with psychedelic can cannabis as a psychedelic here, and also with ketamine. So we work with legal medicines, and and then I teach people how to facilitate these experiences. Um, I teach a practice called mindfulness-based psychedelic therapy, which brings in the importance of presence and the, the facilitator's own experience as being a central component of the, the reflection and the resolution that occurs. Um, there's something about being witnessed in a healing experience that um, is deeply healing and therapeutic, you know. Um, and then I teach how to use, underneath this umbrella of mindfulness-based psychedelic therapy, I teach how to use cannabis as a psychedelic medicine. Um, there's a lot of nuance and very specific protocols and things that are, that are required to engage this particular medicine. You know, just as, say, psilocybin is a six to eight hour journey experience, a typical cannabis journey can be two or three hour journey experience, you know, so I teach all of the details of how to, you know, and the logistics of how to actually be a guide in the room. Um, and then the other thing that we teach that I'm learning more and more about as significant is that how to navigate the personal transformation that occurs and being a guide for others. It's like being on the fast track of personal evolution, you know, and that could be really bumpy for people. Uh, like I said, it, you know, it helps people wake up. So they wake up to all their struggles and issues as much as they wake up to their gifts and uh, where they're aligned as well. And so I, I do, I teach and do a lot of transition work. I help people transition uh, careers. A lot of people are wanting to do have careers in medicine work as opposed to whatever they were doing beforehand. So, I, so like my path, my I go back and forth. I teach people how to navigate um, the space between their old way of living and the new way that they're stepping into. That's kind of like my my realm of living right now, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Pro, the program's called Psychedelic Sitter School, and you can just Google it um, or, or psychedelicsitterschool.org if anybody's interested in learning more. Absolutely. We definitely will link everything to the show notes, uh, all the Thank information, because yeah. I find it super valuable. Um, I was just going to open a window here when you said I actually help people transition as well. So one of the things that I'm observing in helping people to wake up, I like the word actually, I never saw it that way, but I, I see it because I always find these, you know, terms waking up or enlightenment a little bit far, a far outreach and kind of sometimes confusing for people, but I, I do understand. But when you say simply waking up to your own struggles and your own reality, I think that's just spot on. And I find from my observations that when people go through these processes, number one thing, they want to change their jobs. Yeah. Isn't that the most common thing? People just want to quit and move on and, mm -hmm. and do a job or get into a, something that is meaningful and purposeful and fulfills them. Right. Yeah. So you're not just trip sitting. So, so now I just want to open a window here to get your opinion on so many companies are popping up left, right, and center lately, teaching how to be a psychedelic uh, assisted therapist. Sure. Or at least how to be a trip sitter, how to use these powerful substances to hold spaces for people. And these are so such a short courses, Daniel. It kind of like scary. Yeah. Like yeah. it really worries me, especially if people are being um taken on board if they haven't got any therapeutic background and they just coming in because it's trendy now and it's hyped. 
Um, yeah. It really is worrying because um, one of my teachers would always say, be careful when you wake people up. That's a huge responsibility. It is. So, yeah. so when you say, you know, you know, helping people trans, you're not just facilitating a medicine session. You are actually, you know, you become this container for them until they take back their agency and their autonomy, right? And yeah. until they become so resilient, build that capacity to finally move on, you now have to contain all of that for them. It's like you're, you're holding it for them. And imagine somebody who has no idea of all of this and just want to be a trip sitter because it's trendy. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah. Well, I, I agree with you to, to a large degree, to be honest. And, you know, one of the things that we pay, we're witnessing now is a lot of ketamine clinics opening and people be sitting for ketamine experiences and um, with no training. And, and when a client has a major breakthrough, um, that might be really big and loud, like crying or wailing or screaming, that these people will shut it down and um, turn off the ketamine and shut it down and send them home. And from our perspective and our, our center, we consider those to be the most important and healing moments and that we, we know how to hold space and facilitate that uh, letting go that breakthrough in a, in a safe and contained way. And so I think there can be real damage to, um, uh, to people uh, when they uh, have an unexpected experience that the facilitator is not ready for. So in our training program, you know, we have multiple intensives and then we have what we call practicums where we are like monitoring our facilitators as they're practicing the skill sets. And then they have like a lot of practice sessions that they're required to do with supervision. And it can be a year or more longer process. And even then, you know, I would say a lot of the skilled guides say it takes good five years before you become a really good facilitator for others, you know, so, so we consider, you know, when we work with younger or newer facilitators, we have a lot of support around the facilitators as well. Uh, you know, like we have the clinical director, we have the medical director, we have my guidance as well. So we, we hold it as a group. So, um, so that an individual facilitator isn't required to hold that bigness by themselves. And so I, I agree with you. And a lot of training programs now, because of the legality of the medicines, they actually don't offer the medicine experience it themselves. Or it's like one retreat, um, you know, one time and you get one experience. And I don't think that's enough. You know, I think people need to have a lot more experiences than that to understand and navigate that space. Um Therapeutic skills are really great, you know, um, but what we're finding also is that um, they're not uh, the only uh, skill set that's required and, and that like our ministers, um, they're coming from a different orientation and they, they're really good at holding these spaces and in, in, in the container for folks as well, you know, so you know, I, I, Allison, my wife, she wrote an article recently for our blog that says, don't quit your day job. We need um, professionals in the, in the field that are, you know, not psychedelic guides and therapists, you know, so like our team is about half and half, you know, like our team is pretty extensive. We have the facilitators. We also have schedulers and accountants and bookkeepers and marketers and web designers. Um, I have, you know, legal experts who are also medicine practitioners. So it is possible to, you know, like to find that role for yourself that may not be a guide in the room, but it's still a medicine practitioner. So we really advocate for people to, you know, find a transformational way to do the skill sets that they've you know, spent 20 years or longer developing as they transition into being a guide, you know, to don't just quit your, your job right away because you've been inspired to do this work. Um, That's great advice. You know, Thank you. Mm. Yeah. You know, I think some people just to, just to go further on that, you know, like it's great to have that vision of, you know, and realize you're called to be a guide, but we don't want to minimize the skills and the training required to do that ethically. And, uh, and I think this is an advanced skill set. Like there will be master's programs in this. There will be, you know, PhD level or MD level programs in just facilitating psychedelic journey experiences or the equivalent in indigenous communities, right? Like it's, you know, these are really big experiences. I've, 
you know, I've been a guide for over 20 years in a way, in different ways. And I feel like I'm still just beginning, you know, the, the, on my understanding of these, of these practices. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, my understanding of the way the indigenous people categorize, you know, who is, uh, who should be eligible for us, uh, for to be a guide is probably the age, um, the years of experience in the medicine and most probably the age. I mean, mm. um, the ranking system, like the older they are, the more respected, mm. not just their, how many um, sessions they've held or ceremonies they held, but just because of their life experience. Just and their what life they, experience. Right. You know? mm-hmm. mm. I think that's going to be something that we mm. need to have more education, I believe. And I think mm. you guys are doing that already, pioneering mm. the space. So thank you for that. Yeah, you're very welcome. It's a true privilege and honor to have this as my job in the world, like what a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know we're coming to end of our conversation. I can probably ask you so many more questions, but I'm, I'm probably going to not take so much of your time, but probably have you back for second part in the future, if that's okay with you, just to follow up your, you know, um, your progress and, and also the, the uh, teachings of how to hold space. But before I let you go, can we uh, talk about the integration process? Is it similar sure. to the classic psychedelic substances? Is it, or is it different how you guys do the integration? With cannabis? Mm-hmm. It, it is. It's just like, again, it's just like the other psychedelic medicine. So, you know, in our protocols, we always have preparation sessions. We always have integration sessions. And, you know, it's just, it's, and, and a lot of really important work happens in the post journey sessions. And, you know, I'm really, you know, it's like, what are you called to do now? What's different now? What's available to you now that wasn't available before? And, and it's just bringing in like a real regimented, goal-oriented path to integrate the understanding and the learning that occurs in in these deep spaces and and then the 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 difference with cannabis as a psychedelic is that it a psychedelic journey experience with cannabis can also help integrate uh, journey experiences with other medicines and so the example i like to say is that like say you did an ayahuasca retreat and you did a lot of really great work but you're like 90% there, you know, like you just didn't quite tie everything up in a nice pretty bowl at the, a bow at the end. And, and the idea of going into another retreat might be just way too much for the nervous system or time, you know, and commitment. Um, What we found is that people can take a psychedelic cannabis journey experience, two, three hours, uh, one afternoon and find resolution and find completion and everything that was stirred up and moved in that, sil- or, you know, ayahuasca journey experience and such. So in a way, cannabis is an integration tool because, because of the somatic quality of the medicine, it brings everything back into the body. And that's something I've learned to really value. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so versatile to work with cannabis. I understand the way that you are explaining. Um, yeah, what is your? Love to introduce it to you sometime, Susan. Mm. If you ever want to come to Boulder, <laughs> we'll set up a circle for you. Oh, that would be amazing. Of course, I've never traveled to US. Hopefully, that's something in the horizon, in the future. And um, again, uh, I'm just so blessed to come into the space very, very late in life. So I've never had any recreation. I say this in in my episodes a lot of the time. Um, my biggest blessing is that I've never had experience um recreational or creative even or just to escape to numb to to bypass none of these um interesting i grew up in the uk but i never came came across so i always say maybe i i was uh, living under a rock i don't know and then certain age i i just realized oh wow there is something called psychedelic plants and um especially with marijuana i still like to call it marijuana over here um I when I first f- discovered that I knew it was special. I knew it was something sacred. I knew I just had that, you know, when you just know in your gut feeling. There is, I had no negative connotation or stigma or any. That's kind great. Of, mm-hmm. Right, none of none of all that. So this is my blessing. So mm-hmm. I do I do respect and love and honor all of these plant allies, and I just want to say thank you and I appreciate you doing all the work and education part as well i think this is what we're going to need more as we are Mm -hmm. 
moving through the Renaissance, the psychedelic Renaissance. That is yeah, happening. We're all advocates. We're all ambassadors to these medicines. And so mm. I think we're all being called to share as much as we can. So a lot of gratitude to you for giving me this opportunity to share with your uh, community. And thank you so much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure and honor. So we will add all of your links and your information. Is there anything you'd like to, oh, I forgot to mention this or something that really um, that you want to share with our listeners that you find value in? Sure. Well, I think just um, going along with the theme that healing happens in community. And uh, for those of us who have been hiding or had to be keep it very private because of safety concerns or prohibition, just an invitation to step out just a little bit more and connect with people that are in alignment with you. And um, that's part of the healing uh, that we're all um, that we're all asked to do. So, you know, we're available. There's other wonderful, beautiful communities available. So just an invitation to reconnect, and, and particularly in this post, hopefully post COVID time that it's time to start reconnecting in community. So, um, so that would be my message right now is, is come play with us. If you're interested in, in, and um, in, in, in called to work with uh, cannabis as a psychedelic medicine. Brilliant. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Daniel. You're so uh, welcome. Thank you. And thank you everybody for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. If you have any questions or you'd like to reach out to Daniel or myself, do comment in the below and maybe you can reach out to Daniel and his team if you're interested in learning more about cannabis, psychedelic cannabis uh, therapeutic use. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Much love. Take care. Thank you so much for joining us. Psychedelic Conversations podcast is designed to educate, inform and expand awareness. For more information, please head over to psychedelicconversations.com. You can also share with your friends or leave a review so that we can reach more people. You can also join us in our private Facebook group to keep the conversation going. This show is for information purposes only and it is not intended to provide mental health or medical advice. Thanks for listening.